Hello, everybody. Welcome to my talk, Gout 101 and a Plan for Remission. My name is Dr. Pete Delanoy, and I am a PhD biochemist and a nutrition network coach practitioner. In 2016, I was diagnosed with gout, and in 2019, I was diagnosed with prediabetes. I went on to the ketogenic diet and reversed my diabetes in 52 days. And I've been on the ketogenic diet now. I'm going into my fourth year. It's about a little over three years, and I put my gout in remission. In today's talk, I'm going to lay out what I believe is a more accurate hypothesis of the gout condition. The reason why I'm inspired to do this is because I want to be able to serve as a help to the people that are diabetic, that are significantly obese, and that are suffering from gout. I want to help these people find a way to end the pain and reverse their conditions. So what is a relevant gout hypothesis? I believe that the gout flare is or starts in the cartilaginous joint, that the source of the inflammation is in a specialized cell there that is called the chondrocyte in combination with the innate immune system. And the way that it works is that we have the arrival of hyperglycemia, if it's an evening meal, alcohol, along with fructose. I'll get into the details of this in a few minutes. And the consequence of the fructose and the hyperglycemia, which drives the formation of endogenous fructose, is the sudden acute rise in uric acid. And this sudden acute rise in uric acid within the chondrocyte makes the chondrocyte sick, it communicates with the innate immune system, and we have formation, or we have the activation of a gout flare. The fundamental basis of this hypothesis comes from the work of Richard Johnson, who has spent decades and has written hundreds of publications along with other collaborators and has put forth the hypothesis of uh, that is called the fructose uric acid pathway or hypothesis of diabetes, obesity, cardiovascular disease, and, I'm, and I am arguing, by extension, gout. Now, gout historically has been considered a disease of kings and queens. The Egyptians first wrote about gout 26, some 2,600 years before the Common Era, and they talked about the fact that there was a linkage between honey and alcohol in the gout condition. And it wasn't until hundreds and in thousands of years later when our economies started to even out and the wealth was redistributed that the disease of kings and queens transitioned into the general population. I also want to talk about at this juncture, you can see in the picture, we have this overweight individual who is his, uh, who is drinking alcohol, his feet are bandaged up. And the whole point of that is to, to suggest that there is a stigma associated with this. And I believe that is to the case that gout sufferers, uh, people who are diabetic, people are, who are significantly overweight, that this is something that they have done to themselves and that this is just a question of stopping the behavior. And I want to point out in, in this presentation that I reject that, that this is something that we, we need to figure out in our society how to get past that stigma and have a conversation about the biochemistry that is going on behind these conditions uh, so that so that we can fix them. And this is really an important concept. So I'm I'm going to say for the second time in this presentation that I'm a gout sufferer and that I have found a way to get in remission. And I want to talk about this so that we have a, a better way of functioning, so that we can end the pain, so that we can reverse diabetes, the obesity issue, 
and we can improve our cardiovascular markers along the way of putting the gout in remission. So let's look at some statistics. Firstly, gout exists about 4% in our population. So about 4% of the, of the individuals in the U.S. suffer from gout. Uh, it's a serious inflammatory disease that is extremely painful and debilitating. If you ask a gout sufferer, including myself, during a flare, what is the level of pain? They're going to come back and tell you that it's a 10 on a scale of 1 to 10. So the, the condition itself is significantly painful. If it's extensive enough, the individual may not, because it usually occurs uh, in, in the main uh, joint of the foot of the toe joint and, and or in, in a knee joint, it, it may well be so painful the individual cannot walk. A full 43 million people in the U.S. are hyperuricemic. And what this means is that they're walking around with high uric acid, but a significant proportion of those individuals are asymptomatic for gout, which means that they have elevated uric acid, but on the other hand, they're not suffering from gout flares. And not everybody who's hyperuricemic is ever going to have a gout flare. This is an important point because this goes to the current idea as how gout occurs. And my hypothesis is in contrast to this, but let's keep talking about the statistics and we'll come back to it. So the mean concentration of uric acid in a gout flare is 8.3 mg per deciliter. We need to just speak momentarily about the reference range, which extends from four to eight. So the majority of people suffering from a gout flare have uric acid concentrations that are at the top of the reference range and not outside it. Next, a full 18% of these individuals will have uric acid between six and eight mg per deciliter within the reference range for your, what, what the medical establishment considers as being normal uric acid. And a full 14% of them will have uric acid values under six mg per deciliter, so well within the normal range. So it is possible to have a gout flare with uric acid levels that are considered completely normal. And then the last piece of information that's super important here is that when the joints of hyperuricemic people are aspirated and we look for the presence of crystals. Crystals can be found in the joints of a significant number of people that are hyperuricemic, of that 43 million people that are hyperuricemic. This suggests that the presence of a uric acid crystal, while I agree is required for a gout flare, it is not sufficient. There must be other factors that are involved in the gout process to get to the gout flare. The last thing that I want to say about this is that the simple idea that we have uric acid being produced at the liver, and I will get to that, that enters into the circulatory system, that makes its way uh, into the synovial fluid. This is the fluid that bathes the chondrocytes, the biological cell, which is required to maintain healthy cartilage that the uric acid makes its way from the liver. It diffuses into the, into the joints where it crystallizes and then causes an inflammatory event where it causes the gout. This hypothesis must be flawed. It's not just a simple question of uh, uric acid moving into the joint, making a crystal, and then generating the gout flare along the lines of somebody getting a splinter in their finger. The splinter causes the inflammation and pain and the swelling and the redness and the inflammatory event. The system, this is a process. The gout flare is a process. And yes, we need uric acid in the joint and we most likely need crystallized uric acid in the joint but the process of the gout flare is more complicated than that. It, it is not sufficient just to have the crystal. 
you need other factors. What are the comorbidities that are associated with gout? And this is an important question to ask because we are led to believe that gout is like this isolated uh, injury that is sitting out there somewhere where you can take an anti-inflammatory to make it go away and it doesn't have any connection to anything else. We believe that, that the gout condition is an endpoint of a central driving force of the typical metabolic diseases that tend to, to occur in clusters. So when we look at this data, we see right away that over three quarters of gout sufferers also have high blood pressure. They suffer from kidney disease. A full quarter of them uh, are type two diabetic, uh, over half are obese, and a significant number also are suffering from cardiovascular disease. And when you get into the weeds on this, all right, the common thread here seems to be metabolic syndrome, which, which has a central driving force underneath that, which is driving the metabolic syndrome and then driving these chronic uh, metabolic diseases of which gout is, I'm going to call it a pinnacle disease, right? It's one of the final endpoints that's, that is rising out of this derangement. So what are the characteristics of metabolic syndrome, which are uh, highly associated with gout sufferers? We have high triglycerides. We have a high fasting glucose is usually, um, this can be also connected to an A1C, which is sometimes elevated in these individuals on top of the uh, disarrangement or the derangement of the fasting glucose. We have low HDLs. We have a high waist to height ratio. This would be in English, the beer belly. And then I've added to the list elevated uric acid. So what is the model behind the metabolic syndrome that's leading to this constellation of chronic disease of which the gout condition is part of this? And this model comes from the work of Johnson, uh, the fructose uric acid model of diabetes, obesity, cardiovascular disease, and by extension, similar mechanism, we get to the gout condition. So to summarize that model here, and there's strong data, there's animal studies, there's human tissue culture studies, and there's clinical studies uh, relative to the brain, the kidney, and the liver. I'm going to use the liver model to talk about the basics of this hypothesis. So in this hypothesis, we have the arrival at the liver of what I call simultaneous excess calories. So we have individuals eating the standard American diet, which of which there are five to six standard American meals every single day. And in each of those meals, they usually are hyperglycemic. And they also include a high fructose load because of added sugars. Fructose comes from table sugar, of which 50% by weight is fructose and or high fructose corn syrup, where 55% or greater accounts for the fructose load. Then we have agave syrups where the fructose can be coming in at, at um, values of 90% or higher. Honey, which is 55% fructose or more. And then finally, processed foods which usually have significant quantities of added sugars of the type that I just described, which will have a high fructose load. And if we happen to be talking about a standard American meal at dinner time, then there probably also is a simultaneous large load of alcohol. And you have this condition this condition of simultaneous excess calories that are all arriving at the liver at the same time. You have the hyperglycemia, the alcohol, the fructose. Now, 
Let's talk about the hyperglycemia first. So the glucose is going to enter into the liver. It enter, it's, it's a regulated process I don't want to get into too much detail about right now. And when the glucose comes in, it's going to completely full. It's going to completely fill the glycolytic pathway. And there will be pooled at the upper end of that pathway a pool of glucose because the glycolysis has feedback regulation, and it will uh, modulate how the glycolysis pathway is operating to maintain the stability of ATP in the liver. Next, we're going to have the, uh, um, the incoming alcohol, and the alcohol comes into the liver in an unregulated fashion, and there are a number of effects that the alcohol is gonna have on the liver. In this presentation, I am going to stick to the top one, which is the fact that alcohol activates a pathway called the polyol pathway that can converts a significant portion of the glucose sitting on top of the glycolytic pathway into endogenous fructose, which I'm gonna talk about in a moment. But going back to the glucose just for a second, we have this high concentration of glucose coming in to the liver because we have a hyperglycemic event. And glucose also activates under those conditions the polyol pathway. It, the hyperglycemia activates the enzyme called aldose reductase. The alcohol also is activating aldose reductase. So we have hyperglycemia and we have the alcohol activating the polyol pathway with a significant portion of that glucose, which is going to be converted into endogenous fructose. We also have the fructose coming into the liver, and the fructose comes into the liver in an unregulated manner where it is going to be phosphorylated by an enzyme called fructokinase. This transition from fructose to fructose 1-phosphate is quantitative. There's no feedback regulation involved in that transition. The result is we are going to see the pool of ATP in the liver decimated. We are going to see the concentration of phosphate decimated. And then a few steps down that process, we have a sudden acute rise in uric acid. And don't forget, we also have significant endogenous fructose coming in from the hyperglycemia and the activation by alcohol. All that fructose, the endogenous fructose, is processed in exactly the same way that I just described to you for the exogenous fructose that's coming in with the meal load. So the sudden acute rise in uric acid is going to cause activation of the inflammatory cascade. And in our presentation today, I need to mention that there are two proteins that are going to be activated here. One of them is junk one, and I'm going to come back to junk one later, and also the inflammatory cytokine, IL-1 beta. Both junk one and IL-1 beta are sitting at the pinnacle of the inflammatory cascade. We are also going to see the programming of the liver switched over from where the mitochondria is functioning to burn calories to produce ATP, where the mitochondria is going to be essentially shut down and the liver is going to switch over into what's called de novo lipogenesis, which is going to have two consequences. One, there will be the formation of oil droplets within the liver which eventually, if this, if this person is eating chronically like this every single day, can lead to non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Secondly, the triglycerides that are being produced during de novo lipogenesis are going to be transported out of the liver into the circulatory system. What I just described for this switch from burning into de novo lipogenesis is what Johnson calls the fat switch. So this transition, the fructose metabolism into the high sudden rise of uric acid is driving or flipping what we call the fat switch so that the cell where this is happening 
stops utilizing the mitochondria to produce ATP, switches to de novo lipogenesis and produces and produces fat. The last effect that we need to mention here is that the nitric oxide pathway is dysregulated by the signaling molecule, the high sudden rise in uric acid. Now let's see how this applies to the gout condition. So I am proposing that in the articular cartilaginous joint where the gout flare is going to happen, that we have the chondrocyte, which is a specialized cell where this fat switch also exists and where this metabolism also exists. Now, what are the two main reasons why I think that we have to talk about the chondrocyte being important to the actual gout flare, that, that, that this is something that's actually metabolically happening in the joint versus something like the liver producing the uric acid, which is moving to the joint, which is then somehow driving the flare. So I'm proposing that the action is happening in the chondrocyte uh, or in a biologically specialized cell, which is, which is in the joint uh, where the gout flare is going to occur. So there's two pieces of information here. First, if, if we allow ourselves to think about the chondrocyte undergoing this metabolism, the fructose metabolism that is generating this, this sudden acute rise in uric acid, it puts the site of action, it puts the production of uric acid right in the joint, which is driving the gout flare. The second thing, and, and some of you, this, this may be somewhat confusing to think about, but the synovial fluid contains uh, macromolecules and solutes that get there by diffusion. And there is data which suggests that during a gout, uh, excuse me, during a gout flare, that the concentration of uric acid in the joint is higher than the concentration of the circulating uric acid. And the reason why this is important is because solutes do not move up concentration gradients. That's like saying that water will flow uphill. And most all of you realize, I, I would hope that water can't flow uphill. If we, if we have a lake that it has a dam on one end of it, common sense dictates the water is going to run downhill from that, right? The river won't run backwards up into that lake. And we have a similar situation with solutes that are in the circulatory system. They travel downhill in terms of concentration gradients, unless there's some kind of specific mechanism that burns energy in order to pump uric acid uphill into the joint. So there is evidence to suggest that during the gout flare, that uric acid levels are, are higher than the uric acid levels that are in plasma and in serum. And I'm proposing that the only way that can happen is if we have the action of the uric acid production going on in the joint. Now, I, I know that there could be other mechanisms for this, and I will try in this presentation to come back and address those later. Uh, for example, a crystal that's already present that's for some reason is, is undergoing some spontaneous decrystallization into soluble, soluble uric acid. But I believe it's because of the production, the sudden acute rise of uric acid in the chondrocyte with movement of that uric acid into the synovial fluid, which bathes the chondrocyte. So first, let's look at what the chondrocyte is capable of doing. Number one, I just talked about the issue of diffusion. So we know from a lot of published papers that circulating glucose, fructose, uric acid, free fatty acids can freely diffuse into the synovial fluid. This is the fluid that is surrounding the biologically important cell, the chondrocyte. Secondly, if we ask what is the chondrocyte capable of transporting into the cell and out of the cell, first and foremost, we know that the chondrocyte 
has the transporter GLUT5. So it can transport fructose into the cell. We also know that it has GLUTs 1, 3, and 9. GLUT1 being the primary actor here in transporting glucose into the cell. And there is data from the world of osteoarthritis that looks at hyperglycemic events to know that GLUT1 is actually upregulated under conditions of high glucose, optimize, optimizing the transport of glucose into the cell. So we have a hyperglycemic event in the case where somebody's eating the standard American diet. And that means that we also have a hyperglycemic event in the synovial fluid because we know that glucose can freely diffuse into the synovial fluid from the circulatory system, similarly for the fructose and for circulating um, uric acid. We know that the chondrocyte also has the transporter uric one. This means that it can transport uric acid out of the chondrocyte and into the chondrocyte. We know that, that the chondrocyte can produce junk one. And this is going to be really important because we, we're going to talk about the inflammatory process in a second and, and the fact that junk one is involved in it. And we also know the chondrocyte when the inflammatory cascade is activated can produce L1 beta, which is sitting at the top, the cytokine, which is sitting at the top of activating the inflammatory cascade in full. And then lastly, what else do we know about the metabolism of the chondrocyte? We know that it is a glycolytic cell. It specializes in glycolysis. We know that the chondrocyte is sitting in, in an environment bathed by the synovial fluid, which is hypoxic. We know that the environment is also hyperglycemic. Every single time somebody eats a standard American meal that is significantly high in glucose, so we have three aspects of chondrocyte biology that we know activate the polyol pathway. The hyperglycemia, which upregulates aldose reductase. The hypoxic environment also activates the polyol pathway through aldose reductase. We, and we also know that elevated uric acid feeds back to potentiate the aldose reductase, in other words, to activate polyol pathway, producing potentially endogenous fructose, which downstream produces and activates the uric acid. Now, let's just step back for a minute and ask about what needs to happen in the joint. What, happens, what has to happen for a gout flare? Well, we need the elevation of uric acid, and we just talked about that. We need the inflammatory cascade to be activated. So the synthesis, the production, the elevation, the activation of junk one and IL-1 beta. And then something that I haven't really drawn on quite yet is we need the formation of the NLRP3 inflammasome. This is the protein complex that causes the gout flare. So here is the model. We have a chondrocyte and we have this individual that, that has been eating the standard American diet for a long time. Most people that come down with gout have gout flares are people in my age group. So in the late 50s, as they're pushing into the 60s, this also happens to be the demographic for type 2 diabetes. Um, it, it can be a, the demographic for for uh, later age obesity, cardiovascular disease, down the road we go. We have a situation in the joints that is low-grade inflammation, and it's be being caused by the, the consistent and chronic hyperglycemia. The chronic low-grade inflammation will cause the activation of junk 1 and IL-1 beta. I tend to look at this from the point of view that we have primed the chondrocyte for the major event of the gout flare. We have this bi biologically important molecule that is um, partly ill, right? There's this low-grade inf inflammation going on. And so we already have the inflammatory uh, mechanisms that, that have been activated to some degree. 
And then we have the deadly triad arrive at the cell. And the deadly triad is going to be the hyperglycemic event. If it's an evening meal, we're going to have the alcohol there potentially. And then we also have the individual eating the added sugars. And again, those are going to include the table sugar, the high fructose corn syrup, agave syrups, honey, potentially, and then processed food, which has added sugar in it. Bottom line, we have the arrival of fructose in the synovial fluid. Those three components, the fructose, if it's entering the, the chondrocyte, is going to generate the fructose the way I described earlier. Then we also have the hyperglycemia and the alcohol, which have the potential for activating the polyol pathway through the activation of aldose reductase with formation of endogenous fructose. The fructose through a series of steps is going to cause the sudden acute rise in uric acid, which is then driving the inflammatory cascade. We push past a threshold with the production of the junk one, the ill one beta. We have the fat switch into de novo lipogenesis, and we have the dysregulation of the nitric oxide pathway. And we have the signaling to the innate immune system, the combination of macrophages and neutrophils to come together and form the gout flare. So let's look and see what data we might have for each of the three things, the activation of the polyol pathway, activation of de novo lipogenesis, and dysregulation of nitric oxide. First things, I mentioned the, the activity of junk one. So in this 2017 paper, this research group showed or demonstrated that junk one is required for formation of the NLRP3 inflammasome. And there has been other significant data which has shown that gout flares require NLRP3 inflammasome. We know that junk one is produced by the chondrocyte. And in this case, it's being activated because of the inflammatory cascade. We also know that the polyol pathway in this 2015 paper by Laigion, which demonstrated under hyperglycemic in, um, conditions where they showed the inflammatory cascade to be activated when they used the, an inhibitor of aldose reductase, they showed that they could mitigate that inflammatory response, which indicates because they downregulated aldose reductase by inhibiting it, that the polyol pathway seems to be activated in the chondrocyte. We have two papers. One of them is 2022. That's what I was trying to remember. So it's very recent. And the other one is 2015. These research groups were able to show activation of de novo lipogenesis. And in fact, when the de novo lipogenesis was activated, they were able to also show Cartilage, cartilaginous degradation. When we turn to nitric oxide, this 1995 paper by Blanco showed data that indicated when we have had the rise of endogenous reactive oxygen species with downregulation of the nitric oxide pathway, which is typical of a cell that has had a sudden acute rise in uric acid that under those conditions uh, that uh, this led to cellular chondrocyte death. And lastly, we know that when somebody ingests alcohol, that the synovial fluid will have comparable concentrations of alcohol compared to the circulatory system. And in this uh, KC paper, um, which was in 2015, they were able to show the, that the presence of alcohol led to cartilaginous degradation. So putting all of this together, I believe that the chondrocyte, this biologically important cell that exists within our articular cartilaginous joints is at the center of the gout flare. Over time, it, uh, the, the chondrocyte and the joint will, will have uh, low-grade inflammation. And then when we combine that with the deadly triad, so the arrival of hyperglycemia, alcohol, alongside fructose coming from fructose sources, 
all of this together, we can throw the fat switch. So we, we drive the chondrocyte into elevated and an elevated inflammatory event, uh, which leads to de novo lipogenesis and also dysregulation of nitric oxide. This sickens the chondrocyte, which actually can push it into the programming that leads to cell death. And in that process, the chondrocyte is going to release monosodium urate into the paracellular space, along with IL-1 beta, which is a signaling inflammatory cytokine that activates or recruits the innate immune system, predominantly macrophages and the neutrophils. We also can have release of, of extracellular ATP also into the intracellular space, which also will signal the innate immune system for the formation of the NLR P3 inflammasome. When we bring all this together, that's where we get the gout flare that is occurring. So now if we step back and we ask the question, all right, maybe we understand more about how a gout flare can happen. What can we do to put the gout in remission? What would an eating plan look like? Well, first and foremost, the most obvious is that we need to eliminate the alcohol. We need, we need to eliminate sugar high fructose corn syrups, agave syrups, honey, and the processed foods that have added sugar, which is all of them. The next thing we need to do, and I advocate for this, is to cut into the carbs. So we want to move towards a ketogenic diet. And the reason why we want to do this is because when we lower the carbs, we lower insulin expression, and we form uh, as uh, side products, ketones. The most important one is beta hydroxybutyrate, which has been shown through research to actually inhibit the formation of the NLR P3 inflammasome. So by eliminating the main drivers, we eliminate hyperglycemia and we eliminate the sugar and the alcohol then we lower the in, inflammatory um, uh, condition of the joint, right? We bring the chronic inflammation to a close so that we lower the expression of junk one and we lower the expression of IL-1 beta. We also cut the carbs so that we, we go into ketosis with the idea of, of producing beta hydroxybutyrate which also inhibits the NLR P3 inflammasome. So we establish an eating plan, which is a double whammy. We lower the chronic inflammation and we also uh, prevent the formation of the NLR P3 inflammasome. So what does, what does this eating plan look like on a fundamental basis? We've eliminated the sugar. I'm gonna keep emphasizing that. We've eliminated the sugar, we've eliminated the alcohol, and then we cut in to the carbs. We cut the carbs in, down because we want to lower the insulin expression. We want the formation of beta hydroxybutyrate in the eating plan. Because we've lowered the carbs, it's important to recognize the ketogenic diet is not calorie restriction. So when we lower the carbs, we're going to elevate the natural fats in order to replace those calories. We're also going to track biomarkers. It's super important to track uric acid, and we can do that with a handheld meter. And what we want to measure will be the fasting levels of uric acid, pre-meal and post-meal uric acids, so that, so that we can tweak the eating plan even further in order to modulate bringing the, uric, the circulatory uric acid down. And then also, in addition to the uric acid, we want to track glucose and ketones. The reason we're doing that is to make sure that we're in ketosis. And then we also want to measure or monitor our weight and our blood pressure because, again, uric acid has actually been linked to, to modulation of, of blood pressure. And over time on the ketogenic diet, for a number of reasons, not only the fact 
not only the fact that we should be able to bring uric acid down, hopefully with time, but also when we lower the insulin, there, there is a modulation that happens with the kidneys. And, and over time, we should see blood pressure coming down on the ketogenic diet. And this is the reason why we want to monitor it. And with that, I would like to thank Tracy McBeath for inviting me into the Low Carb Lifestyle Hub. I would like to thank Dr. Richard Johnson for his decades of work and his hundreds of publications that led to the fructose uric acid model of diabetes, obesity, cardiovascular disease, and by extension, the gout condition. I would also like to thank my daughter, Tanner, and my wife, Linda, for their unending support of my mission to try and find solutions to metabolic diseases. And as I always say, keep the carbs low, down the road we go.